Beautiful people, we have the one, the only. Landon Tyson. Everyone's entitled to their own opinion. It does feel a little bit down bad when the person that has the opinion has the biggest platform and there's an incentive for that narrative to be pushed. Did I make mistakes? A hundred percent. Welcome to living life. Sometimes you put yourself out there and things don't work out. But at the same time, I know how I've experienced that situation and I wouldn't change it for the world. Lynn took that stance on her podcast where it's like, you're saying something for engagement that you know is false and a lie. That's where I have a problem. If all I did for my entire life was only focus on poker and neglect my family, friendships, relationships, I'm actually not doing as much as I potentially could be. Ladies and gentlemen, beautiful people, we have the one, the only. The I don't actually know if I can call you a kid of poker anymore. You, I don't know how old you are. 24. You look like you could be 20 and you look like you could be 30. <laughs> uh, are you? Half, halfway there, you know, 24. Just cool. turned 24 uh, last Wednesday. So. so we haven't really spoken too much. We've had just like various interactions online. We, we met, I think, once briefly in London. And I just fucking love you. I just think you're great. I, yeah, I just think we've always had really positive interactions. You seem like maybe we could do this, like what are each other's first impressions of each other from the outskirts, you know? Yeah. I mean, I mean, I've always been a fan. Like when I first started playing poker, when I first started getting into it, I knew from like the, not even necessarily like intuitive standpoint, but just kind of the way that you, you see the game and like the way I kind of see it from a way to try to win is pretty similar uh you've probably been a red liner for most of your career you oh know? yeah born and bred yeah so i actually didn't start as a red liner started mostly as a blue liner as most people normally do and then i sort of uh i had yeah man, sure for american at least and then i sort of realized it might be a little bit more to poker than i thought when it came to playing some spots and maybe trying to win a little bit more like trying to find ways to make somebody fold and at some point I've just fully embraced the, the red line strategy and it's been pretty good ever since, you know, I didn't, know I didn't know that about you. So here's, here's, here's my first impression of you on the, yeah, from the outskirts. you like very early got quite a lot of success. Uh, you got also quite a lot of notoriety in the poker world, which is rare <laughs> these days. Like a lot of the famous people are 30 plus, you know, I, sure. I'm still young for the poker world in, in the high stakes community. There was this like big rush of like 20 year olds, maybe, you know, 15 years ago. <laughs> and after that, uh, yeah, not many too, not, not too many up and coming newbies apart from, you know, the old, uh, Ali Asimovich, RTA, you know, things like that. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was very distinct to me, like seeing, seeing you being taken up in these really popular spaces and you, I honestly, I felt like we were similar in a sense. Like I, I had a similar thing. I was young, got in, got a lot of success, a lot of notoriety very quick. I just wanted to be good. I just wanted to be kind. I just wanted to have fun. I loved poker inside out. And then quite quickly met some of like the darker sides of the poker community pretty quick. And I had to kind of toughen myself up. And I, I think that's, that's what happens with you as well. Yeah. Uh, I guess from my experience and the way that I've seen things and look back at call it some of the blog posts I made in the past, as well as some of the challenges I've done too. call it the, the Perkins stuff, call it the uh, Twitter tweet threads type stuff. And when I look at it now, I definitely understand where some of the call it criticism of the public makes sense of like, oh, like this kid thinks he knows what he's talking about. This kid talks like he knows everything and has only been here for two years. And looking back at some of the tweets and some of the things I did, like, I get it. You know, I understand. I look back and like, what was I doing? What did I think I, I knew so much? And oh, now man, I, I wouldn't be so hard on you for that. I honestly oh, sure. like we'll, we'll have people in 15 years look back at Linus Love today and be like he knew nothing. You know, yeah. we, we, we all have to be humble and say like, OK, there are things about the game that we just don't get yet. And there are things that we do get and there are things that we, you know, we, we can say confidently. And it, it ain't easy to know what you know and what you don't know, especially when you're young. Oh, 100%. Uh, so, yeah, I, as much as maybe the criticism's fair, I think the amount of the amount of vitriol that you got seems to me to be like super unfair. Yeah, and like looking at it now, I'm pretty grateful for it happening, just because yeah. I think that I've kind of leveled leveled up in the sense of callous that I have for that stuff. 
because of the prior experience where before, like, especially when the Perkins stuff went awry and had to stop a quarter of the way through, uh, <laughs> Matt was telling me when we went to Tahoe for the bracelet series, like that was kind of during the summer. He's like, yeah, just don't, don't go on Twitter. Don't look at Twitter. And I looked at Twitter, <laughs> yeah. I looked at Twitter sometimes. It was kind of bad. And like looking at it now, it's just like, yeah, that happened. It took the L there. And the comments and things from that has definitely made me a lot tougher when it comes to looking at things from a social media standpoint and realizing what's important. Because then you realize like, oh, it's just it's just not important. What's important is people, people that matter. And that, that, there's something very unnatural about being okay with so many people hating you. But it, yeah, you're right. It toughens toughens you the crap up, and yeah. I, I think it's so important. I mean, it's it's pretty it's pretty obvious now that you've got a lot, like a wider range of how you can act online. I, I I'm a big fan of Spicy Landon coming oh, yeah. at it recently on Twitter. How how how's that arc been for you? Yeah, uh, I guess what I've what I've realized, and it's always going to be like this constant journey of understanding, but. I realized that when I first started with poker and trying to do the whole social media stuff that comes along with it, I wanted to be accepted because I wasn't really accepted prior in most spaces in life before, just wasn't the same person uh, I was and I'm acting as now. But when I first got into poker, I loved it so much, wanted to be a contributor, you know, wanted to kind of provide and have that impact. And I still do. But I realized how much of back then I really just wanted to find that acceptance in a group. The whole just just is human nature, you know, when you like something and you love it enough, you just want to be accepted by the people in it. And now I've sort of realized that the acceptance has to come from myself more than anything else, like just act in a way that I would feel proud of. And there's some stuff that I would look at now, call it as being a little bit older, I wouldn't have done in the past, but sometimes you just have to exist in that past in order to get to your present and potential future. So now I definitely have much more of a self-acceptance, uh, self-confidence and self-love that I didn't have back then because I was trying to find it in the poker community. And now I just sort of realize that's not the way. Oh yeah. No, I really relate to that. Like I, I, I was bullied a lot as a kid, like basically everywhere. Plus I one. I was at, okay. yeah, plus one. Yeah, plus one, <laughs> plus one. And you don't seem like the kind of guy that would be bullied, honestly. You seem like a, it's, it's been funny. a nah. It's been it's been a been a good couple of years for me from the whole personal development as well as like uh, going to the gym type stuff. Right. <laughs> less, more now, less so then. But yeah. anyways, yeah, it was it was it was interesting for me as well. Like I I had basically zero validation from like family, friends, culture, anything like that. And then I get into poker, and it's suddenly like, oh my god, this thing that I'm sick at people love me for it and it starts to become like your identity like oh i'm a good poker player so then when you go in the high stakes community and you find the other good poker players and there's you know loads of back and forth people being like that guy sucks fuck that guy you know whatever it is there's then so that, that can really that, like, challenge that idea it's so so much it's i i always imagine like how silly it would look if we were watching like scrabble players being like this guy fucking can never get seven letters out what a, what an <laughs> idiot you know and it just to the outside world must look so stupid we're playing cards and everyone's like this guy sucks at this card game what a loser yeah i mean there's so much of that uh just nowadays anyways and then you sort of realize that the best call it like top upper tier players that do exist are now on the other side of that where they just acknowledge how good other people genuinely are because everybody knows how hard poker is so when you know that someone's working and trying really hard and getting results and finding some new ideas, you're like, oh, this person doesn't really suck at all. He's actually just really good. And it's okay to accept that your opponent is good at poker. It makes, it makes everybody better. Like we've seen the improvement of everyone in the poker space in these past couple of years. And it's going to keep happening with the automated Sims type of stuff, especially with Ruse, you know, and it's been a complete overhaul. I'm sure that you can relate to in the past five years where most games stay pretty stagnant for a long time. And then someone becomes an innovator. But now with everyone having access to the answers, the people that work the hardest become the new innovators. It, it was an interesting transition, maybe over the last seven years. So I, I, was a, I was a 500 Zoom grinder or higher, and I watched as GTO came to the poker world. And I watched as people got really, really into it. And for the first year or two, they just sucked. 
Like they were just like god awful. Any good blocker, they would just call a six x pot shove. Like Ben Ben Heath and I would just come up with our anti GTO strategies, which was literally just value bet big on the river when you think they're yeah. gonna have decent blockers some percentage of the time. And it, it we were just printing in those spots. <laughs> but yeah, as people got better and better, as like OTB Red Baron came along and was kind of showing people how you could mix strategies, not just see that ninety percent of what everyone was doing before and um then uh, yeah obviously and now in the age of linus and people like that uh it, it's it's definitely getting tougher and tougher uh i will say though that bar the top echelons of poker from what i've seen there's still so much misapplication of game theory that a lot of these games are just like almost softer than they used to be which, mm -hmm. which is kind of crazy because that so many people are so predictable uh, yeah, there's definitely a trap. There's definitely a trap when you first start trying to learn new stuff and things look the same but aren't, four textures seem the same but aren't, three bet pots, four bet pots are different, but people see them as the same thing. And then definitely leads to that misapplication, if you will. So let, let's, let's duke this out. Let's duke this out. Because I feel like we probably agree on most things, but there's probably some fundamental disagreements that we have about, <laughs> about game theory and poker. Um, mm -hmm. So I've never worked with a solver. Um, but I, I do salute to all of the solver people out there for helping me learn about poker. Right, you're solver adjacent. Like you never yeah. ran a sim, but you're boys that ran the sims. And... So I think the difference between me and most players that are, especially the most teachers, are that a lot of people will say, if you want to exploit, you need to know the, what the theory says, what the, what the solver says, and then you want to deviate from that to exploit. I don't do that. I don't do that. I do have a good idea of what the soul will say in a lot of different situations, but I don't go here and then there. I actually just go in straight to the answer. And in my opinion, that's more working in reality. And um, <laughs> in my opinion, it's, it's, a, it's a better way of getting to, to higher exploits. Now, I think that the downside to that is that when I'm playing against the best in the world, there will be some spots that I'm just understudied in. And there'll be some spots where they found these exploits and these nodes that, that, you know, my now me being on the level above just isn't, isn't going to work because they they've done so much work into like specific nodes, but there are just so many nodes out there. There's just so much to learn. There's just no human can learn at all that I, even in the highest, uh, highest stakes, I still had a really good time. Um, but what I found is that a lot of people who are learning and going like here and then there, when they're playing against lower stakes players, especially, or like even mid stakes players, they're making huge, huge errors in spots where they're meant to be like only like probably bluffing 0% or like other spots where they're only, uh, only bluffing, you know, mm. or they're only meant to be three X pop bluffing or things like that. Um, so yeah, just, that was a load of energy. There are, how, how do you see it? Yeah. So, I mean, I was someone when I first started learning poker, learned from, uh, I was actually backed playing 20 and L this was like four years ago, uh, shout out to Steven, uh, Still love you, Steven. And <laughs> Steven is not a solver guy uh, as well. Steven was uh, mostly like exploit guy, still knows how theory works and has just played so much poker up to this point. And from there, there were some situations where I definitely learned sort of the fundamentals of poker when it came to value betting hands and then pre-flop adjustments and then trying to figure out bluffs later once you sort of understand how to actually get value for hands, especially at lower stakes, it makes a ton of sense. If you can just blue line, which you normally can, you'll be all right. But are you winning the most? Probably not, because there's definitely spots that people find overfolds and are capped and things along those lines. And then two, about a year and a half, two years later, found Pio Solver, started running some stuff, had a different coach at the time, uh, Jeremiah actually, who's doing his bankroll challenge on Twitch. Uh, and I've learned so much from Jeremiah through the solver lens where he's a solver guy, but also on the practical exploit sort of train. And he sort of gave me the understanding that you should learn the theory first and then understand what baseline is, what hands can check raise and what percent of your range should be doing some things, at least at the bare minimum, and then sort of making your adjustments from there. And I did pretty well with him too, moved up from 50 and out to 500 in about three months and just played a ton. Every time I had a question, I just put it in the chat. Every time I would have questions, I would run a sim for it. 
and it's funny because looking back at the sims that I made then versus now are very different and mechanically you just learn more as you go but was still enough to move up in stakes pretty fast and sure probably some run good to be had there you know but anyway anyways got from 50 to 500 after probably six months and then switched from his stable to poker detox which was a exploit based like mass data analysis uh coaching stable i would love and, to talk about that by the way but Karen. yeah for sure yeah yeah uh so with detox it was just like okay the data says this off of 100 million hands if you bluff catch in this node under these pretenses, it's going to be printing. So just trust the data. Don't really worry about anything else and play that sort of poker and you'll win money. And I did. I moved up from 200 and I started there to learn the protocols and then got to 1K in about three months. And then from there had some fortunate Twitch streams and uh, started learning from Nick and Chewy, learned MTTs. Wait, where's MTT. Uh, Shulman. Um, oh, nice. yeah, pretty rare. Um, so from there got into MPTs, Chewy said, Hey, you should probably play some tournaments. And I was like, I mean, sure. Came out to Vegas, started playing more tournaments and then have transitioned to playing mostly MPTs and then online cash every so often nowadays, but tournaments are where most of my study and time goes. And it's, I find it such a fun challenge to be had just because there's so many different stack depths and mechanics and things you can learn that you still can carry over to playing online cash. Because people think you can study one or the other, but. Tournaments are dreadfully unsolved. Like so, oh, yeah. so unbelievably unsolved. Like we still don't have anything that adjusts for edge versus the field, which is one of the biggest factors you need to be adjusting for. So like mm -hmm. every, every single sim that we run, uh you know it might be okay even though it doesn't include icm and like future iterations of icm and things like that future implied bounty equity if you have those things they might be okay if we have zero percent edge versus the field but even if we have like a 10 percent roi which when you're playing live it can be like you know, five times that um uh, everything's going to change you know you're, you're going to want to stop bluffing in loads of situations you're going to want to take lower variance approaches in, in loads of different nodes and so, yeah, when, when I, when I see people running Sims for, for, for MTTs, it's like, it, it's good to understand the concepts behind why the solvers do it, but we know it, that's nowhere near what theoretical baseline is. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I would plus one to that too, where it's kind of, there's always that like in between of is the machine winning the most in the field. And I would say like in a 25 K online, you know, put in a 50 K machines probably going to win the most, but if you start giving called big field 3,500 mains where there's some spots where no bluffs exist or value hands aren't as taken as thin for value in some spots. Now it's probably more likely that somebody that's been just experienced enough and knows how to play those fields well might just have the highest ROI. To, to where, me, it's not even close. I know, I know there are debates about this, but to me, there's just spots where like on the bubble, I'm opening seven deuce off under the gun you know, because yeah. everyone is just heinously overfolding. <laughs> right. Well, you just can't get away with that when you're playing a, a 25K on GG or whatever, but that's not, that's not the point. The point yeah. is in the main event, like you're playing a 10K main, you're on the bubble. People just really want to value the min, the min cash more than the machine would. And the solve outputs would be different if they knew that you're VPIPing 100 versus whatever the theoretical range is. And there's always going to be that conversation. and I think when it comes to the baseline, I would be more comfortable trying to work with a student that's willing to learn the baseline before making the exploits, because I would argue that the exploits come from experience and talent, where people with the propensity to win pots will definitely have more of that intuition and feel for it. And I had this conversation actually earlier today, where a friend said that they would rather work with someone very new to poker that played games like growing up, call it uh, Magic the Gathering, call it Starcraft, right? Games that need a lot of mental acuity versus working with someone that might've played live poker and small stakes online for five years. Because some of those habits are so hard to break when you have like a very slightly winning or losing uh, big lines for hundred where a lot of the newer 
level strat would cause you to break some of your old habits and people don't like changing in some in most situations yeah see there's multiple ways up the mountain and it's something i've realized over time like there are so many different ways you can go the mda approach like poker detox you can you can go my approach which is don't learn baseline learn the exploits as much as you can make all of the mistakes you can and feel what it feels like to punt off stacks so that that knowledge that experience is feeding your intuition in the future that pain is like driving you to not punt the next time and then there's the the more solvery way which is like learn the learn the baseline as best as you can and then work out the exploits as you go and i think or not i think i know that it's not going to be the same for everybody so there are loads of conversations like oh you have to go mda or you have to go gto you have to go fuck gto and no no like some people just don't suit the way that i teach you know some people are just not very naturally talented at the game um but you know if they're not naturally talented maybe that means they need to go more of a balanced approach because they're not going to be making that they're not going to be on that one level above the opponent very often they're actually going to be on the level below mm -hmm. i it's it's an interesting one because all of the best players bar a few in the world they started without game theory you know because everyone's old and that that's that's not that's not saying that you can't start with game theory and then get to be one of the best i'm sure you can but pretty much all of them have they started just fucking range analysis exploit back in the day how phil ivy used to play and just trying to be better than the other people and uh it's it's interesting that we're still experimenting we're still in the era of experimentation can we teach people just through solvers and then create super crushes as well. We haven't actually, from what I understand, seen too many of those. Yeah, it's, I guess nowadays for sure, with the introduction of consistent use of solves, like you can tell from the databases, call it GTO Wizard, call it the Odin, call it uh, Ruse now, which is like the AI uh, algorithm of Pio, where you can just put a board and put the ranges in and it'll just give you an answer instantly where back in the day, that wasn't much of a thing. So I think the ability to scale, if you have enough time and work really hard and like have that talent is very achievable to go from small to mid to high stakes in a very brief amount of time, call it a couple years, where before it was more of like the grind and the elite sort of found their ways to the top in a short amount of time. But most people took a while to move up stakes and make their own mistakes and find out what works and what doesn't work where now you can definitely streamline that process through the use of baseline solves and i think everyone not even in a bad way just most people have a ceiling and i think that everyone can reach their own ceiling especially having some form of baseline approach and then some people's ceilings are greater because they're able to exploit where i remember listening to a podcast that George uh, did with the Wacko and uh, other guy on it, but he was saying most of the, like the highest stakes guys aren't playing perfect theory. Like they're trying to find spots and weird, weird lines, weird nodes to find some raises that maybe the machine wouldn't find or bet sizes that the machine says isn't the most optimal, but from the human element of realizing what percent of range needs to check raise that doesn't and trying to find those hidden edges that you can only sort of find through node locking in some regard, but it's never going to give you that perfect answer. And it's definitely just a bunch of trial and error where you'll see people just go for it in some spots where some of the four bet bluffs don't exist. So people are underprotected in certain situations that the machine isn't. And then using that to try to navigate strategy and find more win rate. Yeah, I would say you can't really even find it node locking. and. Here's, here's what I mean by that. Node, node locking, obviously, as I'm sure you know, it, it has so many downfalls to, to how people learn poker. A lot, like the vast majority of people I've done polls on this don't even know that if you node lock one street, it then like it rebalances the future streets, meaning that that one street node isn't actually that well solved because then you have to assume that it's like they're playing a perfect rebalance after that. Right, uh, it curves backwards. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So you actually need to node lock all streets and then you have so many assumptions about what, how people will play. You, suddenly it's like nowhere near what actual Nash equilibrium uh, would look like uh, because 
or okay, it's, it's, it finds its own natural e equilibrium within that within those no locks, but it's, no, it's nowhere near what reality would look like because your your assumptions are still going to be pretty far off. And yeah. the way I see it is like solvers they can be used as just ideas, like they're idea machines. It's like okay, what happens if we check back and we overbluff this spot? Like, what does the solver need to do to protect it? And do we think that human beings will do enough? And if not, what can we do? Like I, I was talking through a spot recently with, with Yuri Pelag, and he's one of the people that he works with solvers a lot. He works with the highest crushes or some of the best crushes in the world. Yeah, no, he's wonderful. Great, great poker. <laughs> I think he's fantastic. He's a great mind. Yeah. And such a nice guy. Um, Most and, are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah. And um, he, we were talking about a spot where it goes like, um, <clears throat> let's say we open button, big blind defense, and it's ace, queen, jack, rainbow. You know, and um, let's say we we bet two thirds on the flop, or yeah, say two thirds on the flop, and then pot on the turn. And he was asking me, okay, rank these hands and how the big blind would would be doing. How how do you think they would be calling? How do you think they'd be folding? And I was like, okay, most people, most good players, are uh, okay. Bad players are just going to be overfolding the turn. That there's no question about it. Bad players will fold their king jacks. They'll fold their jack ten. They'll fold. They'll fold absolutely absolutely everything. They'll fold their ace fives good players, they'll call a bunch of their King Jacks, they'll call a bunch of their pairing gut shots, um, and they'll fold a bunch of their like ace fives and things like that. And then he said to me, okay, so how, how would you then exploit that? And the answer is like, oh, okay, so we can actually, let's say we turn it with like pocket Kings here, we can actually barrel the turn huge, make them fold all of their like ace fives and stuff and get them to call all of their like, you know, pairing gut shots. And that that's like a weird exploit that I wouldn't have, I, I, I intuitively get, like, I intuitively see those things, but in game, I probably wouldn't have found it because I didn't have that idea planted into my head. And as soon as you get that idea about that spot, that then transfers to loads of other spots as well. And you can find if, different, like more situations where you're folding out better and getting caused by worse and things like that. So I, I do love salt, even though I don't work with them. I love working with people who have found them. I love that they can create ideas. I just, my, my thing is, you know, the fuck GTO movement is that so many people, they see these solver solutions as though they're God's word itself. You right. Know, it's like the like, answer. If you it's use a size that solver doesn't use your, your, it's a bad size. That's not a thing, you know, that kind of, that kind of mentality. Mm -hmm. And to me, that is an absolute mind virus along with utilizing blockers in a way that you're making your whole decision based on this one blocker when the guy's just folding 80% of their hands anyway. Um, yeah so. <clears throat> so like i guess where i would uh agree as well is i use solves nowadays especially for like baseline ideas and heuristic finders mm -hmm. where maybe you find more leads in some spots you find more barrels with hands you don't or some imposition raises in some spots where you shouldn't where like the king's idea is definitely a super good one where it's definitely hard to find and like it's so easy to just pigeonhole okay theory would never bet kings here I'm not betting this hand just gonna check and if he bluffs i'm gonna bluff catch and if he checks and like the river's good i might find a half pot value bet type of thing where it's so much of that plague of if somebody doesn't follow the machine perfectly they're bad or if they choose a size that the machine wouldn't choose they're bad and it's so easy to say somebody's bad while they're laughing their way to the bank with the ev yeah. of the hands that you're overfolding because you think you're some sort of genius and it makes you feel good and lets you sleep at night yeah i've, I've had a lot of that recently with my with my uh, 500 to 100k challenge i've had people just making videos about me or comments and just being like <laughs> this guy making this making this kind of play i uh, can't believe you do this kind of thing and I'm winning, I'm winning pre-rake at like 25 BB per hundred or something, some, some insane, like my red line is like 30 BB per hundred or so, like 40 or some, some, some crazy number. My blue line's fucking died. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so how did that, how did that challenge even start? And I know that you were going to take it, but there's definitely a possibility you take it. People get like their boys to come play in a pool they never would just to kind of smash. <laughs> so it's two, it's two separate things, right? So I'd already started the $500 to 100K chat. You know, I did the 50 to 10K, just fucking smash that out after taking a lot. Yeah. Uh, and then I, 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 I was starting getting back to co into coaching because I've started this Discord community, which is, it's really, really beautiful community. You should come check it out. It's, it's honestly so positive, so much poker talk. So it's so, it's so sick. Mm -hmm. um, you'd be a great addition. It'd be great to have you. But anyway, so I realized I was doing so much more coaching 
of 100 an hour, 200 an hour, 500 an hour, whatever it was. And I've crushed those stakes for you know, eight years, whatever, whatever it is, nine years. And I realized that even though I, I still understand the game, I didn't understand how other people were playing as much as I used to. And there were loads of spots in coaching that I'd be like, I, I think people will play like this, but honestly, I'd need to be back in. So I, I just jumped back in. And I saw I had $500-ish on GG. Uh, and I was like, oh, I'll just play this and spin it up. I didn't even tell anyone about it. And I played 100 now just so I could spin it up, whatever. Mm-hmm. Who, need, who needs that? There's no such thing as variance. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I, I span it. And I was like, oh, OK. I could probably actually do this as, as content. If I'm actually sitting behind a fucking computer playing 100 now, 200 now, I should probably just make content out of it. Yeah, might as well click OBS and record. Ex- right. Exactly, yeah. So um, so I did that, and I said, hey, guys, I'm going to turn this $500 into 100 k Let's do it on GG uh, or wherever, wherever the, the wind takes us. And it, se- it seemed, you know, a really, really positive thing. And then it, w- it was interesting. I, I made a mistake. Here's my mistake. I went on stream. And I wanted, I had loads of people messaging me saying, hey, what do we do? There are all of these coaches out here selling content that they're basically, they can't beat the games that they, they're they proclaiming to be able to beat. So, you know, what? How, it seems really unethical that these things are happening. So I, I jumped on stream and I, for the first time ever, I let the clickbait side of my brain win over the ethical side, I think, without really mm-hmm. noticing that was happening. And I, I called it like exposing scammers. And I, that was a pun. And I, not once did I actually call any person a scammer on the stream, but just having that, that title, Mentality. yeah, it just, it turns, it turned the, it turned it toxic very, very quickly. It was a big learning lesson. It was, it was a big lesson for me. It was like a, a very, very quick thing. And I had the people on, we had some great conversations with, I made friends with, with the people that were being called a scammer and I, I helped them clear their own name, but still that mentality arose around it. And the conversation for a lot of people turned into, well, if Charlie's saying these people need to be more transparent with, with their results, he needs to be more transparent with his results. And I, you know, my results are public because I was a tournament. Yeah, you're like, oh, that, that, that's no problem. A couple yeah. million here and there, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, I haven't been a cash game player, you know, in, in a while. I did the bankroll sure. challenge, but apart from that, I just haven't. And they were like demanding a graph, uh, but I, I didn't have the, the hands because I, I, I didn't use a HUD. Yeah, um, I my so, so essentially, uh, it, it all accumulates into a lot of people being like, Charlie sucks at poker. And I was like, whatever, man, we'll, we'll bet on it. We'll bet on it. Because usually when people say I suck at poker, I'll just say we'll bet on it. And then they run away. And I was like, fuck it, I'll do the bet. If they want to, if they want to bet, I'll do the, I'll, I'll this do was, this was the second time people tried to make a bet with you about something. Because the first it was the 500 zoom bet. Nobody took that. Not exactly. A single, not a single person took that. Yeah. Uh, which was crazy after my whole career of people being like, that guy sucks. And I was like, okay. Can't be 500 you. Zoom. It's like, all right, how would I bet you on it? Yeah. <laughs> and they're like, no. <laughs> no. Yeah, they're like, no, no time no, no time for that. I'm just going to yeah. keep, because it's, it's a thing about trying to keep a narrative alive, where as soon as that narrative is able to be squashed, they don't have any ammo anymore. It's like, oh, you can't do this. Okay, bet me. No, I don't need to do that because this is what I think. This is what I feel. It's like, if they don't have any sort of reason to keep that going, no one ever says, oh, this was a bet that you were supposed to make. It's just, well, he didn't do it. See, there's no challenge anymore. Yeah. yeah. So that that then uh, came out and a, a few people, I, I put it out online and a few people said, yes, I got uh, Andrew Chen. I got <coughs> um, a couple of other people. I got the nerd guy and I got Zin Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, I was talking through them and I was like, hey, I just got word that one that a streamer, his name's Kakati, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. wanted to wanted to come and just mess with the bet. Do you have any solutions to this? And they're all just like, no, nah, let's just bet. And I was like, oh, that's fucking convenient, isn't it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so I, eventually the, the energy around it just felt really toxic. I would have had to start the challenge again. I'd already done like, you know, 15 to 20 K hands. Mm-hmm. Um, and I decided to, I, I was like, I'm going to do the hundred K hands. I'm going to prove that I can crush, but I'm not going to bet hundred K on it because I don't, I just want to, don't want to burn hundred K and then have loads of people just flock me and, you know, fucking mess with the thing. So I'm, yeah. out playing, I'm out there playing 30% VPIP. Right. Might as well just do it anyways. So yeah. it's like, I, I don't need, I don't need the bet to prove it. Cause at that point it's just, you're just doing it for yourself and results 
speak for themselves like long enough period of time where if you just do it to completion, it's not like there's a hand sample that you have to worry about with a variant standpoint and you can just be free in the sense of going for 3x pot if you want to, whether it, or not. It feels a lot nicer. If, if, and I, as much as I like to try and be above the ego, you're exactly right. You're exactly right. It's like when, and I'm sure you had this with, with your challenge as well. It's like yeah. when you have to meet a certain BB per hundred, every loss feels like, oh man, even, even break even spells feels like, oh, fucking no good. And it's, it's hard for me. It's hard, hard to be above that. I'm, I'm a quarter of the way done and I'm winning at, like I said, 20, 24, 25 BB per hundred pre rake, which is like 15 post. Right. Um, so very, very likely just going to annihilate this. Um, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. It feel, feels a lot nicer not having, not having people rule yeah it's it's a very interesting thing as the public narrative as to how the bill stuff even kind of came the way it did where i just wanted to play heads up i thought nine was fair if he didn't try and then he took three months and tried and got decent and as we know with heads up no limit uh it's easier to go from a massively losing player to a less losing player and like call it break even right that window where you start checking back more uh pre-flop ranges also was a mistake because uh, like you just have that thing that allows you to get some win rate, win rate back instantly uh and then also trying to maybe have some strategic changes like oh bet small here add an over bet here check back sometimes you know all of that stuff adds up to playing better poker very quickly yeah and i i didn't watch too much of it but bill Ker bill perkins to me is a guy that will gift you 400 big blinds if he's in if he's in a generous mood it, I, I don't know. I don't know if he was doing that for your bet, though. Yeah, uh, he definitely studied and tried more, especially because of the public platform type of thing, where I sort of used it in the sense of like making memes here and there. It's like I remember one of the things during the Super Bowl. He was at a Super Bowl party, and I said, "Phil's at a Super Bowl party, and I'm in the lab. Like we're not the same." And people sort of saw that as like an ego thing, where it's genuinely to me just jokes. Yeah. Um, and from there, like nine big blinds per hundred is definitely a lot, but call it stipulations of the bet. If we said that I could study and get good at heads up no limit, because I've never played heads up no limit extensively at that point. I was just a fan enthusiast of the game, if you will, doing commentary with Joey, falling asleep on streams because they were four hour streams and I was tired. <laughs> I remember but, those, man. Yeah. So I was like, you know what? Let's play heads up. Nine seems fair. And if he got nine and wasn't able to study or learn heads up no limit at all and we just played call it that next week and i could still study and get good because i'm paying him to just show up and be him that bet definitely sees its completion but in the negotiation process where mj was supposed to play limitless that never happened and he said oh let's do it after mj and limitless play which will take about three months and i was like all right sure that sounds like reasonable enough and yeah. he's like all right book it and then like went into the lab and actually kind of tried and played a bunch and uh, That's against the spirit. Of pretty the decent. I, I don't. I don't blame him for it because you know you want to get good, but it is. Oh, it's against the spirit. I mean, there was no rules against it. He said he wanted to train. I said I also wanted to train too. And then from there, like nothing was ever call it unethical or wrong. And it was just he got pretty decent. I got better at heads up no limit, and it's pretty funny because I played about thirty thousand hands, uh, just versus random people. Uh, had some people I would spar with sometimes uh, others less so too and my win rate uh, in big lines per 100 through playing those practice matches was 10. oh that's so annoying, <laughs> <laughs> so, that's uh, so annoying. yeah so uh it is what it is and what, what like, did you get to with bill what was your baby with bill uh with bill i was winning at 3.6 and then 4.02 adjusted over 4900 hands and looking back very recently i look back at some of the hands from that i'm like oh i would definitely not do this now i wouldn't do this now i would this hand's just the same you know just got wrecked here and there and in a 5000 hand sample it's not like you can make many conclusions but yeah, you can possible. know how good somebody is playing where it's like oh they picked a turn bet with the correct size with this hand or they found a bet with this hand that should never bet you know yeah. you can look at those things and make and the really and bill is just not not just blasting you know that's the yeah. biggest it's yeah, awesome. it's it's crazy because in the times that he necessarily kind of was, and it's it's wild how fast time goes because this bet was done two and a half years ago, almost yeah. at this point, long time ago, like literally 
forever ago. But there were some spots where he either got up to a quick lead or I got up to like a quick lead of like three buyers or something in a session. And then he started saying, you'd play like, I don't give a fuck mode anymore. And when he was playing like that, that was dangerous. Right. Where he started bluff catching more. He started redlining more. And it's like, oh man, like now I have to definitely like just accept the variance that is this game, you know? And looking back at the way the challenge went, would I do some things differently? Yeah, hundred percent, you know? but maybe that stuff had to happen for me to get to this point now. And for that, I'm super fortunate to have the experience as well as on, call it on my side, everybody's cool. You know, they're like, yeah, this was a spot where if he didn't get good at poker, like it, it could have been a really good spot, you know? And it just worked out in his favor and paid the side bet. Everything was, everything was clean. So he was super reasonable about it. It was like, yeah, like I'll just take my money and, and go. Yeah, <laughs> I'll you take gotta, my you and go home. strategy and just get somebody to agree to heads up. That's just yeah. it. You know, yeah, like, it's not, not, none spot. Is donating nine BB. Nah, Doug was the big winner. Cause Doug would play bill as like practice. And they would just like, they would just play <laughs> the spot. Doug, Doug was the ultimate winner. You know, you just gotta, you gotta give it to him. It was like, Hey, I'm trying to study. Like you want to play some two, four. He's like, sure. Why not? So funny. Two yeah. fours and two, 400. Yeah. God damn it. We'll play two, we'll play two. <laughs> yeah. How, 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 have, how have you, how have you been around the, the recent, like, let's, let's talk about the, the, the poker drama with, between your boy Berkey, who I don't know if I've actually had a proper conversation with ever. Uh, mm -hmm. but we just mutually existed in the space, never had any bad blood. Yeah. Uh, and then Nick, Nick Airball, who, uh, also I've never had a conversation with, but, uh, for some reason, I just feel like he and I probably wouldn't be best friends. Um, but you know, nothing, more yeah, nothing against the guy, but, uh, yeah. And then, and then Doug obviously getting involved as well. Uh, yeah. what, what's your, what's your perception of, of the kind of like the narrative behind what went down there? Yeah. Uh, I think just kind of what happened from like very brass tax standpoint nick goes on doug's podcast calls matt a scammer says that matt's not good at poker not beating the games that he's beating and anybody can generate and create a fake graph which 100 percent is true like people can do that but as someone that's known matt for the better part of three years now uh i definitely know and have ideas of his results as i just have some action and some of the stuff he does and he's given me money for it and i've never given him money for it so <laughs> he, that's a good either, sign either for he's me lying and <laughs> giving you money for the sake of the lie or he's being honest right so there's you could pick which one right yeah, yeah. and then uh don't get me wrong like nick's definitely obviously here for the like villain era aspect and villain era is good in any industry issue being when you call it like integrity attack and both people kind of have the script where maybe things are different, where like they have a conversation prior. It's like, hey, I'm going to kind of dunk on you a little bit and we can play heads up and this will be an entertaining thing for the people. And then Matt agrees and then Nick kind of goes on his war path of, of terror. So it's like, oh, okay, this is agreed upon. Like this is content, you know, and I'm willing to be on the other side of it. But the integrity part is sort of where I take the issue. Because like, if you look at someone like Helmut and Helmut sort of being the heel that he is, like people like seeing him burn the Rio to the ground and uh, do all those things. He doesn't attack people's character in that regard. So there's ways to be the villain in a good way, if that makes sense. Yeah. So it's just like the ethics around that. And at the same point, you can argue, oh, what do ethics even matter? How real can it be anyways? You know, it's just my opinion versus yours. And like at the end of the day, here we are now, they're playing heads up and Matt doesn't have to give anybody big lines per hundred and they're just, uh, they're just gambling. So we'll see how it goes. They've played about 26 and a half hours so far and it's been fun to make content around it. And I understand why Matt doesn't want to give it more of an effective public platform from his side, but it's, it's nice to be part of something when you're not the one in certain instances. Like I had my whole time in the sun, so to speak, with the bill stuff. And that was never fun, you know? And at least from the social media standpoint, and Matt's just trying to do this thing, do as well as he can. And Nick's getting better, which he's allowed to do. It's not against the spirit, but spirit in the sense of, if you looked at today's challenge where breaks wise, after the break rule got implemented, much less breaks from his side, you know? 
much less of uh, the taking advantage. So to I speak. honestly cannot believe that that happened. Like it, the, the the sheer audacity, the the absolute buffoonery of somebody calling someone else out online, being like, "This guy sucks at poker," and then turning up asking to have his coach next to him for no reason, just sitting there <laughs> silently for a hundred hours, and then taking breaks every however many minutes. And then also claiming to be sick for a week to obviously study very, very likely, at least allegedly high probability. It is to me, I cannot believe that somebody can come, can go through that and still claim any kind of like social dominance and not retract or rescind any of their previous statements about him being so easy to beat or anything like it, it is absolute insanity that that's the line he took. Yeah, and from what it's worth, like after having that per like experience with the Perkins challenge, what I realized is from the social media public perspective, call it from the X's and O's, people aren't going to care about all that stuff when it's said and done, at least from the public perception. It's who won, who lost, that's all that matters. So if like Nick got that extra edge in EV from taking this time off and getting good, and Matt said that Nick played remarkably better than the first week that they played which is obviously good on his part for studying and trying because he can and at the same point seeing that some of these things were definitely taken liberties because there were no effective rules against and at the same point you can argue okay if these things are in place and there's no punishment is it actually an issue and you could tell from the spirit of the bet standpoint there are some things that aren't necessarily great but if you know at the end of the day what the important part is is did I win or did I lose and try to maximize that potential EV in winning? It makes a hundred percent sense, but at the same point, spirit of the bet wise definitely has taken a detour. When you say, oh, hey, you suck. I'm going to play your heads up. Now I'm going to get my friends to help me. Now I'm going to get my coach to help me. Now I'm going to start taking more time and start tanking a little bit more spots just to make the match go a little bit slower. We play less hands. Damn. There's a bunch of different things you can do in order to give yourself a better chance to win. And at the end of the day, like Matt still likes his spot. And just because someone gets better doesn't mean they become can become a monster. But from the public perspective, they don't really know how much EV could have been gained back from not playing for that week or having those breaks at the times that he could have them without any punishment. Because it's very possible it could be somewhere between mid to high like mid five figures, low six for just like taking that week off and just playing. And Nick even said today in like one of the spaces that he was doing that he is taking a break from full ring, like the games that he normally plays and is just going to try to study and play heads up and try to win, which he's a hundred percent allowed to do. Don't get me wrong. It's just one of those things where now it's turned into you suck, you're bad at poker to I'm going to play you in a format that neither of us know very well. And sure, like, are you going to be fundamentally better in some spots? Yeah, probably. But at the same time, I'm not going to play you in the format that you're comfortable with. We're both going to learn new things and play this learning curve. And now I'm going to try to outwork you and as well as have variance work in my favor. Because if let's say Matt even has a five to 10 big blind per hundred win rate, he's still going to lose 40% of the time. And that's still worth a ton where if Matt ends up losing the challenge, Nick now gets to say, see, look at this. I did all the things I could do, beat him. He's clearly a scammer because he's not good at heads up no limit and variance worked out in my favor. So I, don't, a... I don't think the poker world will be that unforgiving if Berkey loses, honestly. I, I think that luckily on both sides of the argument, there aren't too many absolute idiots that are so results oriented that they'll, they'll just be like, done like in football where they're like that team's better told you so <laughs> mm -hmm. or in fighting or whatever the most results oriented sports you'll ever find but in, in poker I, th I think especially <laughs> especially with all this talk around it i do think that the prevailing narrative will be that it was just a heads up grudge match and there will obviously be clout and kudos for whoever wins but i i i, I think the the narrative of berkey being a scammer or a fraud is is just gone uh yeah. I, I really think that's just dust I, i'm curious on your take of um just in, like take take Doug's video for instance, um, where 
or he had a couple of videos you know he had uh, the interview was with, with nick airball and then he had the 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 really funny uh kind of hit piece on... yeah i mean very funny video okay gotta give it gotta give credit where it's due you know but anyways like he, Doug's obviously able to do what he wants in the sense of like nothing, no one's going to stop him from doing something that he knows is going to work from the clickbait perspective. Uh, Doug has even outright said he doesn't think that Matt is a scammer. Does he think that Matt's bad at poker? Yeah, sure. Right. They call him a fraud. Yeah. Assuming basically saying like, okay, you're not good at poker. You're saying you're good at poker. I don't think you are. And when you have the biggest platform, you can 100% control the narrative in that regard. So it's like everyone's entitled to their own opinion. It does kind of feel a little bit down bad when the person that has the opinion has the biggest platform and like is just a competitive business uh company so it's like there's an incentive for that narrative to be pushed but what i do know is the way that these things are going and have gone the vocal like the vocal uh well it's always gonna be like the silent majority and the vocal minority Right. So whenever you look at anything, there's always going to be people that you do end up seeing in the Twitter sphere, the social media sphere that will kind of pick up on the narrative of whoever wins this uh, is better, so to speak. And anyone with like call it the reasonable sense of rationality that's kept up with all the stuff that's gone on is pretty aware that the results for one don't necessarily matter too much. And it's just a matter of who variance picks where someone has potentially a slight edge, where if somebody got action down on Nick at like plus 160, plus 170, just based off of sheer numbers and variance alone, as well as like Nick trying, they're printing. They're just printing by getting that good of a price. And if that's what like the big, uh, call it deal was, is let's get this heads up match. Let's make Matt this big favorite and then let's get money on plus odds. I mean, by all means, you know, go nuts. Like Nick was talking in his Twitter space that he's got action down on himself to win some side bets as he should. Like if he can get himself at plus 160, yeah, 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 yeah just fucking it, just hammer it. Yeah, just, right. just hammer it. And then, and then also play a lower variance style of poker probably. Yeah, I'm sure at some point there's always gonna be like those strategic differences of at what point and how, like how much money is on the line to just win the challenge outright because yeah. they're only a quarter of the way through now so yeah, definitely nothing to like be locked he, up. He up if he ends up up maybe like 500k he should just limp or tighten up loads i don't know if he's allowed to limp but tighten yeah up. limping's definitely allowed. Like, limping's allowed for sure um i think there's certain like call it dollars won and time left that make more sense to start trying to play a low variance approach at the same time with heads up no limit where you're playing somebody else that's not going to stop Matt from trying to funnel money into the pot as fast as he can in some spots where maybe is it losing some EV in some situations? Yeah. But at the same time, winning some money back would be nice too, you know, because Nick's side bet that doesn't affect Matt's win rate in the game, if that makes sense. Like, oh, tell, tell me, tell me, tell me more about what, what it's like being part of that, that community. Um, so obviously they, they seem to have welcomed you with open arms and you're mm -hmm. part of the only friends podcast. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, yeah. So are the, are these guys that now you're like close out of poker friends as well. Are these like some of your, your closest buddies? Yeah. Um, the podcast honestly for me has been a, a growing challenge in a bunch of different ways. You know, I'll, I look at the first episode I ever did with that and then look at the stuff now and call it it is effectively public speaking, right? Sure, the audience is not directly in front of your eyes, but when you do something that has, in the, on the podcast that nobody watches, uh, like 10 or five figure views on a bunch of stuff that you do, it starts to help you with that sort of conversationalist type standpoint, as well as understand how hard it is to speak publicly anyways, where people think it's very, very simple to start removing uh, verbal cues, if you will, call it like, the likes and the uhs and the ands and trying to just form sentences as a whole and also just get closer with friends that I now see as not just poker friends but life friends and it's what makes it so much fun to show up every day get the podcast done and actually enjoy it where it's very easy to do something for this much time with this consistency and get bored of it but I just find it fun and definitely see social media and 
the YouTube side of things as more of a game and act as if I'm happy with the decisions that I make when it comes to the things that I say, the things I represent and stand for, call it like the spicy land in Twitter arc, where it's like somebody's ex starts blasting you on Twitter. Like there's definitely a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah, around. yeah, I mean, there's a lot of stuff out there where it's like, look, like there's a bunch of stuff outside of that arc that doesn't necessarily matter. It's definitely not publicly. But at the same point, when I have some sort of information on some things and it's effectively harmless and I'm not making up any lies of anything that I'm saying, it's fair game. You know, people want to tell me all the time, like I lost a bill and I suck at poker and all those things. Like you can say whatever you want. I can't stop you, you know, go nuts. Yeah. doesn't affect me anymore. Google like, search either of our names and just go to a Reddit post randomly. You'll find, you'll find a hundred <laughs> people with different opinions about it. I've never, I've never done that. And I don't think I intend to. I've done it a couple of times. <laughs> to, to, uh, if, you, if you ever feel like you need some humbling, go to Reddit or 2 plus uh, 2 and just put a your guilty, name. Guilty pleasure, if you will. Sometimes it's like, fuck it, I'm going to go on Reddit today. Let's see what they got to <laughs> say this time. <laughs> Let's see. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty wild out there. But uh, yeah, I, I, I had a similar thing, you know, I, I, I had a I had a spicy Twitter arc as well. And it was it was at, I, I actually ended up deleting my first Twitter because it got too much for me in the end. And I, I realized that back then, maybe four years ago, I, I just wasn't ready. I just wasn't ready for the the amount of spice. Um and I was still trying to be like good and kind and not too harsh to people. Mm -hmm. And I, I just I just liked it. I was in a dark place in my life personally anyway, so I just I just hit and run. So I made made a new Twitter on uh 2021 or something like that late 2021 mm. <laughs> and um just experimented you know experimented saying something that i i i felt to be true and saying it was with you know more strength and less like oh maybe i could see that maybe and just really trying to be as direct and concise and i realized with twitter so much of like winning the the twitter game is is being precise with your words you know it's coming up with like short quips that get a lot of information through and it's actually really a powerful way to learn how to write something I didn't really realize before. And um, yeah, I started out with the, the COVID stuff because there was so much back and forth with the COVID stuff in, in the poker world. And uh, recently, I just when somebody has been overly negative to me, 98% of the time, I'll ignore it doesn't 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 even come on my radar. Every now and again, especially if they have like a larger audience, I'll, I'll address it very directly. You know, like with Lynn, for instance. Yeah, I remember that. I, I it was like a few days ago. She she was uh, just liking all of the worst comments about me. Like Charlie's an asshole. Now she <laughs> Lynn Lynn liked that. What the hell? <laughs> but when you when you know the person, you're like what the hell. And I I made a tweet about it. I was like, hey guys, uh, just so you know, I'm, I don't usually do this, but there's this person that keeps coming up. What the, what the hell, Lynn? And she instantly DM'd me. First time she'd ever DM me. She's like always been talked to before then and we jumped on a call me her and her boyfriend was there as well they were driving somewhere <laughs> and it turned into like this human interaction i was like hey i have some strong boundaries i don't like when people are like overly negative towards me or other people which you know she was and i saw the real side of her i saw the part of her that was like i want to be like this i, <laughs> I want to be strong but at the same time i want to be good i don't want to be that person and it it was it was a really really interesting conversation where it very quickly went to her just being like oh, okay i'm sorry and i won't do that anymore and yeah. i for me it's it's really it's really important to remember that all of these hateful people they're still people you know and that maybe twitter's just very good at squeezing out some of their worst neuroses or psychoses or insecurities um, but that's not them that's not the definitive of them so even when I'm saying like, hey, Brian Fee, you suck Doug's pipe for a living or whatever, whatever it is, um, there's, as I'm saying it, I make sure that before I do it, I'm thinking of him in a loving way. You know, it's like we're playing a game, we're going back and forth, we're being spicy, whatever it is. Sure. But he's still a human being. And I'm sure that in certain circumstances we get on. And I'm sure that he's got loads of redeeming qualities. And yeah, like the way that I've seen the whole Twitter uh, standpoint now, especially when it comes to like comments from my side or comments directed at, uh, I used to put so much of my own self-worth into the public perception of what people thought about me in any sort of situation. And that's just kind of a part of 
being young and wanting to be accepted, where now I just sort of realize the best version of me just does whatever I deem to be the best logical action. And regardless of what the, uh, call it feedback or backlash is, especially from the negative side, it definitely doesn't affect me nearly as much, if not zero, where I realize that most of those comments and situations are projections of somebody's own self. And if someone has an issue with me for having a platform for whatever reason, and doesn't really matter the circumstance or the instance, but it's me realizing, oh, okay, this person's definitely in a different state of mind that causes them to be in this way. Because what you and I both know uh, at least from the experience that I've had in the poker community and knowing the people I know, the people that are in the best and most successful situations in call it poker, as well as their life personal situations are never taking the time to actively put somebody else down using a platform. So when it comes to saying something that you think is true or like call it in the sense of would do well on Twitter as have some sort of truth and conviction to it, sure. Like there are definitely things about me that are 100% true. And maybe that's some of the reason why sometimes you feel the way that you do when you see a comment at the start when someone hits you with negativity, where yeah. you think to yourself in the back of your mind, oh shit, maybe they're right. Because yeah. if you didn't actually have any feelings towards it, it wouldn't matter. Mm. But we make sometimes it Sometimes it's like worrying there's truth because there is truth. And sometimes it's worrying there's truth because it's just like a trigger. So, you know, like um, when, when I was younger, for instance, and this is a very personal example, mm -hmm. my my mom used to look at me and kind of see my dad's and that would kind of, that would trigger her. You know, I'd have his eyes, I'd have his ways of speaking in some ways, some facial structures. And because of that, she would have this kind of like demonizing energy towards me without actually rationally recognizing that she was doing it. And because that hit me so hard as a kid without me really understanding it for such a long time, I had this recurring pattern in my life that I would seek out people that would demonize me and it would hurt so bad when it, <clears throat> when it happened. And then when it's happening on a larger scale and you know, you'll have, you know, thousands of people saying random stuff all over the place. It's not even like a cohesive narrative. It's just like, this guy's a that, this guy's a that, no, he's not, he's a that, you know, whatever that for me, it brought up all of that, all of that trauma, all of that emotional hurt and brought it to the surface. And until I managed to heal that, it would come forth and it would be my existence. You know, it would be like, oh, this really, really hurts. And I didn't understand why. And so, yeah, it, it, it comes at you in so many different angles. There are things that a lot of people just aren't aware of why it happens. And in the same, same, in the same ilk, you know, people who want to hurt other people online, that will be because of something that happened to them where they were hurt when they were younger. Yeah, like people definitely see, call it some people that have a platform as potential characters and forget that they're real, which is completely understandable and okay if someone wants to have like their form of catharsis and their form of it is I represent uh, someone that was in their mind given so many opportunities and my platform was just bestowed upon me where if they had that, they could be doing so much more. Or if they had the ability to play Perkins, they would have found this sort of thing to happen. And I am the representation of the stuff that they wish they could have had. Yeah. I 100% understand why people would have like call it a problem of being mad or triggering towards me. And it's like, at my situation, I get it, you know, and I used to have such hard feelings towards it internally because i'd always have in the back of my mind oh shit maybe they were right like maybe i was just given everything and i forget about some of the stuff that i had to do to get to this point call it get good at poker in the first place you know have relationships and networks that work out well uh, be, be a very likely person is a huge and, yeah and then at some point like have some form of like likableness authenticity to myself because what I do know is I've never tried to be someone I'm not. And nowadays, I've definitely changed in a, for the better, in my opinion, like the way that I see myself, my own self-confidence, the way that these things sort of don't affect me as much anymore, because I'm trying to find my own place in the world, if that makes sense, like have my own self-acceptance, where now all of the things that used to make me feel bad don't affect me anymore. and maybe this all had to happen the way it did 
and you get some comments somewhere where you do feel like there is some truth to it because sometimes there is and i'll even say it like some people will say like oh yeah like you lost the bill it's like yeah i did and okay like i know how i play poker i know the results i know the people i work with i've done very very well for myself in that regard yeah i lost a bill in a format i didn't play and i gave him nine big lines for 100 that that, that happened you're 100 percent right would I make, did I make mistakes? A hundred fucking percent. Welcome to living life. You can't live this perfect life. And sometimes you put yourself out there and things don't work out. But at the same times, I know how I've experienced that situation and I wouldn't change it for the world. Like I'm happy I don't get to go back in time and redo it. Does that make sense? hundred percent. Yeah. There's, there's not a single traumatic event that's happened in my life that I'm not grateful for. You know, yeah. not, not saying like poker stuff is deeply traumatic at all but you know some yeah. of the actual traumatic stuff some uh, of the stuff that made you like <laughs> reflect personally and once you kind of have the ability to do so because when you're a kid you know when you're young it's not like you have this sort of enlightenment arc of oh man maybe i'm gonna learn something from this like yeah. you're allowed to be upset and be mad you know people have their different outlets but then it does get to the point where if you have that introspection it's like oh how can i deal with this better how can I take those steps and see things for what they are and not what I want them to be? And that's been super helpful. Has, has there been like a, a particular figure in your life in the poker world that that's helped you mentally? I mean, Matt, like Matt's my best friend for sure. You know, he's helped me with a bunch of this stuff. We've had so many screaming matches and like continue, continually have them in no way. a good what, way. What kind of screaming matches? Like we'll talk strategy in some regards. One of the biggest conversations that we had was I was definitely on the like solver boy era where it's like, oh, this guy didn't do this. This is bad. This guy sucks. This is bad. And this happened two years ago. And at some point he just kind of made me realize that there potentially is win rate elsewhere, uh, not just from the machine. And it's funny that it's been sort of proven true from George saying that all the high stakes guys are solver plus type of people where they have the ideas, they get the heuristics and then they make their own personal exploits. And it's like, oh, I have gotten so much better at my way of thinking heuristical analysis as well as trying to find ways to win that the solver would say is absolutely terrible. And it's helped my game immensely, you know? And there's just a bunch of things along those lines where poker is, especially with the network has helped me grow up so much and I still have so much to learn, you know, by no means do I have anything figured out, but I know that the progression from where I was when I started to where I am now is something I don't think I would have found in any other sort of platform or arena, especially with the uh, extra eyes from the social media platform and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah it's, a powerful, it's a powerful feedback loop. Are there, are there any other things that you could point to what Matt has done that's been like particularly helpful for you as a, as a person? I didn't know you two are best friends. So that's, yeah, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, he's done like done everything basically, you know, like even when it comes to like uh, getting me into the gym, getting the whole physical fitness arc of my life. Like I was, I played some basketball, some sports in high school, you know, nothing too crazy. Didn't really take it too serious. And now I've been so much more into the physical fitness while being like, I look back at pictures and things of myself way back when and I'm like how did I ever leave the house like this I'm not even the, the same person by any means and just from that he would always kind of uh coerce me and be like hey like you should come to the trainer you know you should and he probably asked me to do this for months and I kept putting it off and then at some point I did and now I don't go a day without trying to find ways to exercise in some capacity That's and so I've seen so many changes not even just like physically but mentally and it's definitely helped with the, the confidence aspect of things where you start trying to do things to prove to yourself you are who you want to be. You know, like without any sort of proof to yourself, you can't make those sort of internal changes. But now once you start lifting weights, once you start getting in a different mental perspective, of, oh, I am this person that I want to become, it becomes a lot easier to actually believe it mm -hmm. from the self-confidence standpoint. But that's just like very little of the amount of stuff that I've been able to personally grow from just from his influence. You know, there's a bunch of call it smaller things that I can even actively think about. But no, I mean, I, I'm super grateful for his mentorship and guidance. And he's like a friend mentor type thing. And 
grateful for a lot of those people. He's only been good to you. He's only been honest and fair. And yeah, I mean, as far as I know, I mean, also like I get a piece when he plays stuff, he's giving me money back. So he's either lying and giving me free money <laughs> <laughs> or he's winning in the stuff he's saying he's winning in. Like I know Matt obviously extremely, extremely well. And I think some of the public perspective, like anger comes from him talking like he knows things or seems to give off that aura like he knows things. And he doesn't, and he knows that. He's like, yeah, I mean, I literally told him today, I said, I think most people think that you think that you know more than you do. And he goes, yeah, that's probably true. But he and I both know like so many things are just opinions. And when you're strongly opinionated, he's definitely able to say, yeah, sometimes I'm just wrong and I don't have all the answers, but it doesn't come off that way. And that's I think, upsetting. I think in those spots, it's really important to be able to know when to say something with certainty and know when to say something with starting it with a preposition like I think or what, whatever is going to be. Right. Uh, and yeah, it, it can be, it's a balancing act because if you put too much of the uncertainty in, the message becomes less strong and less powerful. But if you put too little of it in, it, it comes across as over certain. Especially when you have like decent speaking ability that when you, even when you do preface something with an, I think, or don't quote me on this, people yeah. will still find ways to make it seem like you're saying, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that it, therein lies the uh, conflict of someone that's like, oh, yeah, I mean, I just have opinions and I really have all the answers versus, oh, this guy thinks he knows all the answers. He's a fucking idiot. And honestly, if that's like the worst criticism that people have to throw at him, then that's pretty, it's pretty damn good. You know, it's yeah. not how they're scamming. It's not like he's, <laughs> he's doing anything unethical. It's like, oh, the guy might have too high opinion of his own opinions. That's it's like, it's a very as, funny as thing. Go, that's pretty. That's pretty okay. It's a very funny thing when the worst thing somebody can say about someone is they do the whole compliment sandwich, and in the middle they're like, "Yeah, his morals and integrity are very high, but <laughs> he knows everything." It's like, oh, so the stuff that actually matters when we're not around anymore, when someone says, "Oh, who are you as a person?" and they could say you had these moral grounded standpoints that you didn't waver on that's what matters at the end of the day not how much money you have not how rich you are you know it's the impact that you've left on people that actually truly know you and those sort of changes because everything else is everything else is material but the virtues don't ever leave so if someone can say hey this guy thinks he knows too much but he's actually a really good guy <laughs> you're doing pretty <laughs> fucking well yeah but it's so easy to get trapped in the social standpoint of oh money is everything you know like this guy this guy isn't good at poker because he sells to the games that he's playing. So he clearly can't beat them. And it's like, well, in business, you know how business works? Like people take out loans and get money all the time. Why is it any different in a poker standpoint? Yeah, I, I, I've <laughs> honestly never never heard anybody serious in the poker world make that make that argument that you need to exactly. have. Exactly. So <laughs> it's the opposite, if anything. It shows like some sort of, some form of responsibility as well as like if you think you can have a good spot and see poker as a business, you take what you can and in some spots if you're winning enough and call in the high stakes FTT scene. Like people selling at markup. There's a lot of pros that are wonderful poker players, like truly some of the world's elite, and they still make money off of markup. And people yeah, they lose like five percent of themselves in 100k, you know, something like that, and they'll sell at 1.04, and then they'll they'll get to print money because they they sell at markup, and it's like a it's a free roll of a trip. Yeah. You know, I, I, I used to do that. I, I never sold too much. I was more in staking deals or I just had most of myself. Mm -hmm. But when I did sell, it was pretty fun. It's like, oh man, I actually get to sell it like pretty good markup. And I basically get to like free roll the, the expenses of this trip. And uh, yeah, it's it's just like a much more comfortable way of living instead of just going like a bank or just going like that, which I did for a while. Yeah, I think that when it comes to the public perception now, most people are very aware of the stuff behind the scenes, especially with like call it stake kings, call it uh, pocket fives, which is now poker stake, where people are very open and honest about selling. Like Ethan's playing this big game at Hustler where it's like $1.5 million buy-in. And he's openly selling on stake kings as he 100% should, where back in the day, all of these spots, there was that glory and that illusion of mystery of, Nobody even asked the question, does Phil or Tom have their all of their own action? Yeah. But now it's all people care about because that's the only thing they can use to leverage to try to hurt someone is, oh, you're so broke that you have to sell to this game. Yeah. It's like the only thing that matters at the end of the day is skill set. 
can you sell and are you winning? And both like the, are you winning standpoint is always theoretical, so to speak. Nobody knows. You know, we never have perfect win rate ideas. We never, we, all we know is plus EV minus EV from what you think. And people accept that based off of selling where like they, like Lynn took that stance on her podcast where she said that she thinks there's some sort of chance that when Matt sold to people that Nick is getting free rolled for the million dollars because the people that he had backing him would just drop out. And it's like, I talked to you about it. And I said, how likely do you actually think that's going to happen? And she yeah, said, like, probably listen. low, under 1%. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, so, so I'm like, oh, so you're saying something <laughs> that you want to use on a public platform that you are less than 1% certain is yeah. actually so I, going I'm just to happen? Saying, like, there's a potential that, that he <laughs> murdered kids and he's got to be in the basement. I'm just saying it's not, not, not like 0% or anything. <laughs> it's just so ridiculous because at the same point, if we go back to the moral baseline of, okay, this guy's a yeah, he's overly opinionated, but he's a good guy. And there's this thing in place that says there's a million dollar stop loss and he reneged on that. That goes against his entire character. And what people forget is now you have to live with that in the back of your mind. And it's not even just call it getting ostracized from the community. You just have to sit there and live with, oh, I did this. And some people can't, some people can. And if somebody's entire platform, so to speak, as well as just stand like, call it uh, staying power in poker is their integrity and their moral standpoint. That's not somebody that's just going to call it, not find a way to sell for what he said that he would sell for. So now you're just actively using your platform to put this narrative in the back of people's minds that there could be some sort of foul play going on. And that's what I won't stand for. Just as a friend and someone who knows him extensively, and I know you know him extensively, where it's like you're saying something for engagement that you know is false and a lie. That's where I have a problem. When when I saw that clip, I honestly just saw it somebody that was deeply hurting and didn't know that they were deeply hurting and didn't know how to handle it. Like some somebody that that had been been hurt in a way that that they didn't know how what was going on. And they just wanted to express that hurt. And the first thing that came to their minds was maybe he's going to back out and yeah, whatever. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, you know, like very clearly seen from the social media public perspective that people know that that's not actually going to happen. And when people kind of have those traumatic releases, sometimes they kind of don't get the better of their own self consciously and you do something and just click record and fire. But at the same point, once that comes out publicly and you said these things and it's not getting taken down, actions yeah, have, have to, consequences. You have to come out and say, actually, I take that back. You, know, you, have, yeah. you, you have to do that. And that, that's something that, you know, like I said earlier, I made the mistake of, of making the clickbaity Twitch stream, you know, and there's something that after I did that and I felt that it was wrong, I had to tweet about it. I had to be like, actually, I'm sorry that I did this. And I'm sorry to the people that felt like I was calling them a scammer because for me, having that energy out there, having the the like untied knot of the unethical behavior that's just kind of kind of like putting it putting it putting its negative energy out there or putting the the mistruth out there or whatever it is, for me it's so important for me that I, that I keep I keep everything I keep everything bundled up and I don't let all, any of that any of that out. Yeah, and like the way that I see most of these things now, even if it has something to do with me or not. Uh, I just try to look at everything with a high point of view, like a very high perspective where I take myself out of it. Call it with the Perkins challenge for me, where I said something kind of in jest and then Doug hit me with a, that's because you didn't work hard enough. And I'm like, you know what? You're right. I fucked up. I didn't work hard enough. I take the loss here and this is what happened. Sure, you can make excuses and say, oh yeah, but this, but that, but whatever. End of the day, results are what they are. And that just has to be the objective truth. And I need to accept that as the reality. You can kind of construe it however you want in your own mind to make yourself feel better. But to me now, like having that objective standpoint and seeing things as not myself and allowing people to have their criticisms as what did happen has become so much more powerful for my own mental state and well-being. You just have to own it and take that accountability. It's so easy to skirt accountability, but at the end of the day, taking that accountability and realizing, okay, what can I learn from this? And what is the mistake that I made is the only way to actually grow from it. That's why when people say to me, you lost a bill heads up. It's like, yeah, I did. You're up. You're right. That happened. It doesn't make me feel bad. It doesn't make me feel less than where at the start, it always makes you feel less than because you think it's an ego shot. It's like, 
the only way it's an ego shot is if you personally take it as one. You know? I, I'm I'm curious. Now now you've kind of like put your your fingers in many different pies. You know, you've got the podcast world, you've got the online MTT, maybe online yeah. cash, live. Got a lot of stuff going on. Yeah. What what's what's the direction for Landon? Like what what does best five years of your life, where does it lead you to? Man, honestly, I went to a, a birthday dinner with a friend last week and they asked me to like make a wish, you know, and I was just sitting there thinking about it. And I was like, if you're asking me to make a wish for my own sort of personal life, everything is exactly the way it should be. I wouldn't change anything for the world, you know? And sure, it does it come to being split in some sort of senses, like doing the podcast, also having the fitness stuff, also trying to play online cash, also trying to play MTTs. Because what you sort of realize is that you make your own choices. Because I could stop doing all of it and focus on one thing. But I've chosen to do all of these different things. I have to live with those decisions. And I very actively love all of them. And I'm super fortunate to be able to do all the things I do and have the win rate that I do and just show up, play poker, you know, and really make the most of it. So uh, the direction that I'm on now is exactly where I want to be. And I'm really grateful for it. Fantastic. And do you, maybe just more of a, a poker specific thing. Do you have ambitions of getting to like number one at X? Yeah. I mean, I definitely love high stakes FTTs and I definitely see myself playing some like super high rollers in the future, you know, and I also just know how much work goes into doing those, you know, it takes a lot. I can't just show up and try to play a 50 K. I'm just, I'm just not good enough yet. And that's a beautiful thing to be because it means it's you're funny hearing you say that because literally all I did was just show up. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, because like nowadays poker is so much harder. It's so much more difficult where it's like, I know that in these fields, like people work and spend all of their time playing the limit hold'em, learning ICM, learning no lock P flop sims, you know, getting really good at the granular aspect of the game that I'm just not there yet. And that's okay. You know, no one said I had to show up after four years of playing poker and then start playing 50 K start playing hundred K start playing all the Tritons where there's a path and there's a journey and there's a progression to it. And I love studying and learning and getting there. And one day, if I'm on the path that I'm on now, I will get there, but it's not like this big center of my world as it used to be where I put all of my self validation into it of if people don't see me as one of the best poker players in the world, I didn't do anything with my life. And in reality, it's the opposite. If all I did for my entire life was only focus on poker and neglect my family, friendships, relationships, or call it own personal impact, I'm actually not doing as much as I potentially could be. So I have that perspective now. Because uh, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of people that put their all into poker and didn't make it. You know, for every solver crusher we find out there, there's going to be like 20 solver failures out there. Maybe even more. Probably, like, yeah. Like, because also when it comes to poker as a whole, who knows if I even get to where I am now if I didn't have time to stay at my mom's place for six months to a year and not pay rent because I was able to play micros. That's what I where, did at my grandma's place. Yeah. So yeah, like, how to rent do- free grind and if there was a different standpoint in my life where I didn't have that ability and freedom where I had to kind of either get a job to figure things out or not be able to have a place to stay I I probably don't get to where I am now you know so there's so much stuff that was out of my control and truly fortunate enough to make the opportunity out of it where I remember back in 2019 2020 when I first started never leaving my room for two years and just playing online poker saying, I'm going to make this work. I'm going to make this work. And then I think you need to have that time and like intensity to just get all of that stuff figured out. But now that I'm at a place where I have so much other stuff going on that I want to be working on poker is still extremely important to me. I love playing, you know, and it's just a true realization that poker isn't everything, but it's something that I really enjoy doing. It does give me that purpose so being able to help the industry and try to be a positive influence and create that positive change is what I want to do with my time. And I know that if I stick to that path, I'll get to where I want to get to. And it's not going to be this overnight thing. You know? 
So maybe, maybe final question. I'm going yeah, to yeah. to my family. After poker, not saying the poker will ever go away completely, but after yeah. you make it, what is what is Landon's life ambition? Do you have a, an idea of how that would shape out? Man, honestly, I have I have no idea. And like in a good way, you know, because who knows how much longer I'm going to have poker in my life as a whole, you know, probably going to be there for a long time. I don't see myself leaving. But at some situations, you never know what opportunities might come up along the way where I just get some sort of new passion or insight that's going to change things. And will I still play poker? Yeah, of course. I love playing poker. Getting good at poker is extremely fulfilling. And I feel like learning new heuristics and kind of getting a little bit smarter every day has been something I love to do. But I definitely can't even pinpoint anything else that I would be doing at the time uh, along those lines. Like what I do know is I just want to keep improving and having my own sort of personal wins when it comes to the awareness of it all, you know, and the actual gratitude of everything where I'm so happy to be where I am now that I can't even think about where I'm going to be in five years. Like that's, that question to me is always just like, man, five <laughs> years, you have no, like five years, that's a long time. Yeah. That's a long time. And you don't even know if you get five years. <laughs> like, <laughs> what I do know is like, I get, like, what I do know is I get today. And it's like, what I want to do today. Well, today is Monday at 4.30 in the morning. Um, I'm going to go Wait, to the gym. It's 4.30 a.m. Are you, yeah. uh, did you wake up early or sleep late? Uh, I took a nap. I took a nap <laughs> after playing and it was 9 p.m. We're living like, different lives, man. We're living. I'm, in the, I'm on the, the <sighs> proper grind at the moment. Sleeping like a baby. Sleeping like way yeah. better than a baby. Uh, but still, yeah, wake, waking up early, doing all the fucking reading to my kid and singing. Man, man I, I've had, I keep trying out new things when it comes to my schedules. Sometimes I go to the, I'll have the really good sleep schedule and I'll wake up at 7 a.m., go to the gym in the morning, then do the podcast, then have the day. Sometimes I'm like, you know what, I actually want to sleep in and then do the podcast, which I can sleep in a little bit and then go to the gym later and still do those things. Where I know that there's stuff I want to do throughout the day that is a non-negotiable for me at this point. And uh, after kind of getting a little bit wrecked yesterday, uh, playing MTTs, just took a nap, woke up at 9.30. So I was like, well, I guess this is going to be pretty brutal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, here I am now. But yeah, like it's always an adventure. And what I do know is I get today. And it's like, okay, what do I want to do today that builds me towards tomorrow, even if tomorrow doesn't come? Yeah. And that's where I found so much of the gratitude for it all, you know? Can I ask you, uh, have you ever got, have you ever tried getting into meditation? Uh, not actively in the sense of I've never given it a fair shake, so to speak. And Can I sell definitely, it? probably, is it a course that I have to buy? Is it a no, 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 it's, for, it's all, it's all up here, my friend. So I'll sell it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and here's how to breathe thing. And then probably, uh, you know, unless it's like a very, very long and instructive thing, they're probably trying to get one. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, yeah. For, for meditation specifically. If you were to look at it through a poker lens, it's learning how to always be on your A game or as often as possible, like aiming towards the point where you're never on your B game. Like I'm, I'm not there yet. I've been, been meditating hours every day for a very long time. Um, and before Easy. I play, I'll meditate the crap out and I'll really focus everything towards it. And if I'm not on my A game, especially if I'm playing online cash, I just sit out and I'm just like, all right, let's go figure out what's up. Am I triggered about something? Is it food? What else is it? Um, <clears throat> but it's like developing this toolkit of like, oh, okay, if I do quick breathing, then this happens to my mind and I get to clear out this stuff. If I go and put my feet in grass and meditate, all of the stress cortisol moves out of my body, whatever it is. If I go, if I go and like do some sun gazing, be careful for your eyes, uh, yeah. Brian then, then I sunburn easily too. Yeah, me too, dude. Look at me, I'm fucking yeah, I'm like Norwegian, a, same colors super, as our fucking super, shirts. Super, super, super white. Yeah. Um, oh, you look Norwegian. Yeah, I see that. Yeah um yeah and then uh, just just so many different things like before bed when you wake up all of these different energy movements that you can do and learn and the it, it's honestly it's it's deeper it's a thousand times deeper than poker and the the levels of nuance that you can find in how to adjust parts of your body your mind and your psyche or your soul if you want to fucking call it that 
Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's so magical. There's so much work to it that you can come at it from so many. It's like poker. You can come at it from this angle or this angle or this angle. These people see that, you know, the Buddhists see this happening, but they actually don't see this, that the, the Hindus see or the Christians see or whatever it is, or the, you know, the, these kind of, this kind of spiritual practice or that kind of, that kind of meditation practice. And I, I really see poker as such a powerful spiritual tool, which I know you do too, even if you wouldn't use that word, you'd see it as like a mental feedback loop or whatever else. Mm -hmm. um, and meditation is just another one of those supplementary aspects and elements to it that can completely re like turn around everything in somebody's life and just make it that much sharper that, you know, you'd be that much more articulate when you're talking that much more strong in your emotions, that much more grounded, that much more aware when you get triggered, that much more sharp in your intellect, that much more deep in your intuition. And uh, yeah, even though a lot of people are getting to meditation, they'll sit there silently on fucking some app and they'll be like, oh, I don't feel any different. It's like, you know, when you, when you first start grinding poke, you don't see too many results either. Yeah, no, for sure. And that's kind of like any, anything that ever exists. Like the more you work at something, the more you, you realize that you know absolutely nothing and that's okay. You become okay with the acceptance of uh, that delayed gratification, so to speak. Man, like I remember when I like first started playing poker and you get some results going like your first upswing and think that you have the game figured out. And then three months later, you realize you were terrible. And then yeah. a few months later, you realize you were absolutely even worse in that other three month stint. And that just continually keeps happening. And then at some point, it's like, oh, you're finally starting to get somewhere. And then you realize that there's so much more to go. And it's exciting. Like, I think that's what makes, call it the best players, get to where they get to, is they always have that infinite desire to learn and improve and never having that ego of settling that, oh, I'm the best that I'm ever going to be. And taking that as a positive challenge versus the negative delay challenge where i look at the meme of like the two guys on the bus where one's looking at like the happy stuff the other guy's looking at like the depressed sad stuff yeah, yeah, yeah. and it, and the same thing it just says there is so much more to learn where so many people can look at that and think i'm never going to get there and pe other people realize it's infinite and they want to play the infinite game of there is so much more to learn i'm excited to try to learn as much as i can beautiful all right landon I, I love you, man. Uh, from uh, from the bottom of my heart, I, whenever I see you interacting online, I'm always rooting for you. Whenever I see you, spicy tweets inbound. Spicy tweets inbound. Yeah. I can't I can't wait to see the arc of how of how you turn out in the next few years. And I I I I I know I don't think I know that you have such a positive influence on the people around you, and that mm -hmm. that's that's so powerful, man. So. It's all that matters at the end of the day, you know. Just be a good person. Try to have a positive influence to your friends, and then maybe make a couple memes along the way. Memes and spicy tweets. <laughs> What else? Right. What else is there? Maybe win a tournament or two. Maybe. Wise words, man. Wise words. I'll be uh, quoted, like word for words, in the future. <laughs> Landon ties twenty twenty three four to thirty a.m. All right, cool. It's beautiful talking to you, dude. Yep, always. Thanks.